have a practical exam we had case presentation last two time uh, but in continuation with this and the request all of you kept it in the dnb you know whatsapp group and telegram group of uh, students uh, today we are going to shift gears and going to cover carcinoma esophagus who better than george you know i say he is a holy grail of thoracic onco in india world figure great friend of mine uh, fantastic surgeon more than that somebody who audits learns relearns documents publishes great academician and excellent teacher uh, and it's my honor pleasure and thank great thanks that he accepted to address all of you for the benefit of students and academics in such a short time all of you know george very well is a professor and head of thoracic onco more than that he is a very good human being and a great teacher george welcome thank you very much uh, and over to you trainees at the end of the talk put whatever doubts you have you can't catch george like this not easy so ask whatever doubts you have how much ever silly they may look don't worry uh, i'll also cross learn with you lot of faculty have also joined for cross learning utilize the chat box and please ask all your doubts thank you welcome and george over to you yeah uh, thank you very much soon for a kind invitation and even the, the kind introduction uh, so um, i'm going to give you a primer to esophageal cancer so it's a mixture of what you are practically doing every day uh, but you don't know what's the evidence supporting it and it's also quite a bit of evidence in each of the points which i've uh, mentioned uh, which you should read up and this is additional reading which you do before your exam because these are most of the important trials which are relevant to esophageal cancer and at the end of it like some said please don't uh, forget to uh, ask me questions because i feel uh, the only silly question or bad quest uh, question is a question you have not asked so please don't forget to ask any questions we have so i'm going to uh, keep it simple this is esophageal cancer what a surgeon needs to uh, know so the scope of the talk is usually an esophageal talk will include everything on demographics to uh, investigations and surgery and adjuvant treatment but i've only one hour in course to the questions so i'm going to limit myself to just the investigations uh inclusive of staging rehabilitation which is an important component the details of surgery it looks small but i quite a lot of quite a bit on so actual practical surgery and adjuvant treatment as well a small section on that so this is how i'm going to define the disease i'm going to address esophageal cancer both squamous and adenoma and for the sake of the stop i'll be addressing basically middle third and lower third over here because upper third primarily and even cervical esophagus is a disease which is dealt with chemo radiation and cervicals do have a role but only in salvage i will also be dealing with cvs 1 and 2 as uh, diseases a, uh, of the gastroesophageal junction primarily adenocarcinoma if you're surprised why i'm addressing this in this talk uh, it's because cvs 1 and 2 are considered as esophageal cancers and type 3 are cancers gastric cancers in the adsc eight edition <laughs> so uh, the recent uh, genetic and molecular studies have confirmed that these diseases behave differently and this is a, a clipping from the ncc guidelines which says that cvs 1 and 2 should be dealt with like an esophageal cancer so that forms part of the stock as well so what are the diagnostic investigations basically upper gi scope is a standard you need to a good upper gi scope basically to get a biopsy and cytology it also tells you where the location is And definitely, you should know where it is middle to the lower third, which is prime surgical territory. You should know the extent of the disease, which also helps you in the neurogenic chemo radiation part, and also helps you in identifying a second primary and barrage esophagus as well if it requires treatment. Now, you might encounter an old examiner who might ask you why is a barium swallow not done? It is not mandatory anymore. A contrast enhanced scan or a PET CT is the standard. It's not mandatory. Also, do not forget to biopsy any other metastatic site if you see it, like a supraclavicular lymph node or a lim- uh, liver, which will help you in extending the treatment which you or lack of treatment. Uh, staging investigations, FTG, PET, CECT is a stand with a, a standard, you know, with a contrast enhancement of the thorax. Uh, this is the clipping again from the NCCN, which says that it is mandatory. I will show you what the evidence for it is. Uh, also, you can use an endoscopic ultrasound and a staging thoracoscopy or laparoscopy. More importantly, why PET CT? Uh, a PET CT upstages uh, the tree or changes the treatment plan in twenty-four percent of patients based on the M stage. 
upstaging in most patients and downstaging in a few. Now that's about the staging part. It's also important sometimes in restaging the patient after neoadjuvant chemoradiation. Uh, this is because a couple of studies have shown that there is a significant number, not small, but uh, not insignificant number of patients, 8% to 16%, who develop interval distant metastasis after neoadjuvant therapy. So it could be used for the staging as well. Now, there are other studies which have experimentally shown that uh, you know, a reduction in SUV, which will help you something or tell you something about the prognosis of the disease. Um, it's experimental value only. And there are some studies which are coming up, like the pre-SANO and the SANO trial, important reading for new students, which has shown that after neogen chemoradiation, if there is complete response, they may actually not require surgery and could be followed up. Again, fortunately for the surgeons, only in the experimental stage and not in routine treatment. Uh, apart from the PET CT, uh, uh, which tells you about the M status, there are the features in the CECT which you should take note. Uh, it is the best in investigation to find, talk about, or uh, detect aortic bronchial infiltration. It's extremely sensitive. Now, there's another feature which I could not put a clear thing. There is a triangular space between the esophagus, the iota, and the spleen, uh, spine, as you have seen. Uh, that is an important area. If it is occupied by disease, it is a sure fire indicator. That is a problem in the operability. Also, degree of contact more than 90 degrees with the iota is a sure sign that there is a problem uh, in operability. Uh, Obliteration of fat planes with the iota, if you look at the iota in a CT scan, if you see a black line clearly around it, it means that the planes are clear. Sometimes this uh, sign is not very clear when you have a very cachectic patient when there is disappearance of fat all over the body. Now, apart from the look, looking at the signs of operability, there are a couple of other features we should look at. Uh, look at the lung, parenchyma, parenchyma including quality, fibrosis. These are important points which tell you how to approach the patient, including whether you can do a transvasic approach at all. Also, please make a note of the aberrant vessels you might see, like an aberrant right subclavian artery which runs posterior to the SIS, or an aberrant right superior pulmonary vein which runs in the sub, uh, subcranial area, which you know which might prevent you from doing a subcranial lymphoma dissection uh, completely. All these small things are to be noted in addition to uh, your features about the primary disease. Now, endoscopic ultrasonography is an extremely sensitive tool for T-staging and N-staging as compared to a CTA or a PET-CT as well. For all practical purposes, I will tell you, the only way we use it in the model and generally most people is for identifying a T1 and T2 disease. That is early stage disease, which does not require neoadjuvant therapy and you can upfront operate. Practically, that's the only indication for endoscopic ultrasonography. I kept a reference showing the best sensitivity for uh, this particular modality. It can also be used to identify T4 disease, particularly of the iota. But in most such bulky diseases, you will find that the probe doesn't go across the esophageal disease and it is a significant uh, limitation. It's a, it is extremely operated to the net. So, uh, of limited utility in routine practice. This, uh, please take a look at the video over here. It is mentioned even in the NCCN that it is an excellent tool for staging in middle third and upper third disease about the carina. If when the patient is asked to cough, you the, uh, the posterior wall moves very well, it means that the tracheobronchial tree is not infiltrated by the disease. Uh, staging laparoscopy. Uh, I mentioned it uh, briefly in the beginning. Uh, CT, uh, particularly the 18 FTC variety, is not very sensitive uh, for low volume peritoneal disease. Also, a staging laparoscopy is mandatory. See what's two and three adenocarcinoma of the gene junction. See what's one, not so much, but see what's two and three. Definitely perform a staging laparoscopy. You can avoid an unnecessary laparoscopy. The two of 20.2 percent of patients in our series in TMH almost 16 percent. It costs a little bit of money uh, and the morbidity at the hospital stay, but it is absolutely required in CVS2 and 3 disease. Now, since I completed what you need to do for diagnosis and staging, we go to the, uh, what are the factors deciding determining treatment. So, as I mentioned, uh, site of the disease, uh, middle third and lower third in surgical territory, stage of the disease, which you found with the, all the investigations I mentioned. It is also important to take a look at the patient. You will be surprised at how many times you will you can decide that the patient can tolerate your surgery and the neogen package based on a general condition of the ECOG status. So ECOG 0 or 1, good candidates for uh, uh, to operate. If you, you'll be surprised at 
the cross trial for instance 88 percent of the patients were ACOG 0 at 1 but in uh, Tarman model when we look at it uh, around 44 percent were ACOG 0 and 1 of the total of all the patients who presented now openly so it's an important condition which you know, precludes curative treatments in patients and you should be gently eyeballing the patient another important thing which you need to look at and ask the patient is effort tolerance and effort tolerance of around two flights or so is a, a stairs means that probably you, this patient can undergo surgery. Uh, after all this, it's important to get a number to whatever evaluation done. That is a functional evaluation, you get a pulmonary function test, uh, basically the PFT and the DLCO because you are giving radiation to the lung and also a 2D echo which will help you assess the cardiac status as well. So after assessing all this, before starting treatment, any form of treatment, be it surgery or neurogenic treatment, it's important to do prehabilitation. That's because of most patients of acidical cancer are nutritionally debilitated and frail. Frailty means that there's a deterioration across several physiological domain. It leads to increased surgical morbidity, uh, increased hospital stay, and reduced survival as well. So prehabilitation improves all these results, the functional capacity, the nutrition, and the psychological well-being and helps to improve the patient's course after a major surgery. So it's not for esophageal surgery alone. In every other uh, cancer as well, rehabilitation is an important thing. So these are a number of trials which are quoted. I hope the DNB gives you the snapshot of the slide. You can quote this, and all these studies have shown that rehabilitation uh, reduces the incidence of complications, shortens the ICU stay, and improves recovery as well. Uh, along with this, it would be remiss if I didn't say that ERAS is important in uh, esophageal surgery, just as well as colorectal and other cancers. It was published in 2019. It gives recommendations of preoperative, preoperative surgical and anesthetic uh, modifications you need to do to your technique. So it is a recommendation of third nine sections and improve short-term outcomes following esophagectomy. It's an important component of your treatment, that's prehabilitation and ERAS. Now I come to the major chunk of the talk, which is surgery. So I'll be speaking about the principles of surgery. What are the margins you need to achieve longitudinally as well as circumferential radial margin, something which you might not be familiar with, uh, apart from uh, probably you are familiar with from rectal cancer. Also the adequacy of the lymphadenectomy uh, and how to minimize morbidity. These are the principles of surgery. Now you had to find an approach to uh, surgery which helps you achieve all this. Once you've done the resection, other considerations are is the resect, uh, reconstruction, which is a major worrying factor after esophageal cancer. So we'll be speaking in detail about the various techniques of reconstruction as well. So what are the margins you uh, need to achieve in esophageal cancer? Uh, this is a, a snapshot, just enough for you to remember. I've not delved in detail into each of these topics because each of them would be a talk in itself. Now, the earlier teaching was that the proximal uh, esophageal margin which we need uh, for a squamous cell carcinoma is 10 to 12 centimeters, which is almost impossible to achieve and would preclude most middle third cancers also from surgery. These are two of the latest studies which have shown that a proximal margin in a squamous cell carcinoma of 3.5 to 5 centimeters is absolutely adequate. Now, margin less than this uh, would show, uh, would decrease the survival as we have seen. Similarly, in adenocarcinoma, this is a study by Babur et al., which shows that a proximal margin of around 3.8 centimeters ex vivo, that is after the section, this is equivalent to a 5 centimeter margin in C2, would give you an excellent survival. And if it's less than that, your chance of a microscopic positive margin is higher, and so is your survival. And with a positive margin, your survival goes down. So a squamous, 3.5 to 5, and for uh, adenocarcinoma, 3.8 centimeters ex vivo. Now, a distal margin is not a consideration in a squamous cell carcinoma because generally the stomach is uninvolved. But in the adenocarcinoma, a distal margin of roughly around 5 centimeters is what is advocated. Now, another important feature which is not the longitudinal margin, it is a circumferential radial margin. You know, the east figures is a tubular structure placed in a critical area close to the iota and the trachea. You could say that you can't go wide around it. A circumferential radial margin of uh, at least a millimeter is required. Anything less than that is uh, related to a poor recurrence free survival and overall survival. So, circumferentially, also, it's important to go all around the tumor. And these are two of the studies which have shown that uh, a poor CRM, one is from India, from our own institute of uh, 
not series which was a, a CRM is actually uh, an involved CRM is actually the reduces is survive. So that's about the primary disease. Now, how do you go about the lymphoid nectomy? I'm sure it's an oft-repeated topic, and probably the title of the study, which is declared by the uh, of this talk, declared by the DNB as well. We will do a two-field, which is an infra-canal lymph node dissection, which goes up to the gastrohepatic lymph nodes as well. Or you could do a total lymph, uh, mediastinal lymphoid nectomy or a three-field lymphoid nectomy. Now, this in itself is a massive talk. You could discuss it till uh, the cows come home. But there has been no resolution yet. All I can tell you is the largest trial, which is a randomized, which is done so far, it's a Chinese trial, more than 400 patients, uh, had a few flaws because they did not include new adjuvant therapy and they compared total media center versus three field, uh, uh, not as two, uh, two field versus three field trial. Uh, but unfortunately, in this trial, doing the extra survival did not improve the disease free survival or the OS benefit. So, a two field lymphadenectomy. It remains a standard for middle and lower third way cancers as well as G junction C was one and two. Now you there is a criticism that this compares three field was total media center. The model has just completed going for a, a two field versus three field, and we'll be soon analyzing it. So that might give a clearer picture of whether there is an advantage with going three field. So currently, two field lymphadenectomy remains a standard. What about C was one and two? I would say uh, treated like an acyclical cancer, so subcranial, low parasitic, paracardiac, and these lymph node stations 1, 2, 3, 7, 8, 9, and 11. That is common hepatic, small splenic, and left gastric and CDI is what you need to go for in terms of lymph node. So, how do you address uh, this? That you need to get the primary out with the CRM, longitudinal and uh, margin, as well as adequate uh, lymph node. So, this again is another topic which has been off debated. The logical response would be that you need to do it with an arms thoracic approach. And for not, unfortunately, when there was a randomized study, not a large one, uh, they found that there was a, a definite a trend towards improved survival with a trans thoracic approach, but the p value was 0.38, that it would be highly uh, likely due to chance. So, there's no strong evidence in favor of trans thoracic. But if you look closely at it, you will find that Sievers type 1 tumors, that is uh, tumors in the, purely in the thorax, there was definitely an advantage with uh, doing a TTE. And nodes, uh, if the nodes were positive, definitely a transthoracic is very uh, um, help. But uh, this is a subset analysis and you know you can place for only that much value to it. So we went hunting more and the authors did a meta-analysis and there are several more uh, which have been done. All of them did not show a clear advantage but trend towards improved survival. But as surgeons, we follow logic, and uh, the, even though the evidence is not strong, currently doing a, uh, the a trans thoracic hysterectomy is the standard, and this is the maximum evidence you can quote. And a trans approach is reserved for those at high risk for a trans thoracic approach. So only in a compromised situation is a trans hysterectomy advocated, even though there is no strong level one evidence for this to support this particular statement. Now, when you talk about uh, Thoracic approach. There are two ways to do it. Is it do you want to do a uh, totally sphincterectomy with a neck anastomosis, or do you want to do a intrathoracic anastomosis? So there is a recent uh, trial, the ICAN trial, which compared uh, sphincterectomy with an intrathoracic anastomosis. Obviously, they pick lesions which are in the lower thorax, that is the middle and lower, uh, definitely below the carina. And they found that the leak rates logically is less than the Iberlose approach because you have a shorter of a stomach tube. Obviously, the leak rate is much less. So they found uh, less complications, less, less recurrent laryngeal nerve injury, and better quality of life in the Iberlose approach. So technically, it seems that an Iberlose has better didn't look at survival, better short term outcomes than a McEwen's approach. Uh, Obviously, you cannot do uh, Ivor Lewis for all cancers and it is generally advocated for uh, advocated for lower third lesions and where you get an ad, uh, you know, adequate oncological margin in terms of a longitudinal margin, adequate lymphadenectomy, uh, then an Ivor Lewis probably is an ideal approach. Uh, but this is the evidence with the ICANN trial that supports uh, Ivor Lewis for a McEwen's. But in practical, uh, in the real world, not applicable to every patient. You have to decide based on, on the primary location and as a lymph node in, involvement. What about 
G junction tumors. This is a separate section in itself because it, as I said, see what's one and two uh, are esophageal to be treated, treated like esophageal cancers, but there is significant controversy. To me, the best evidence supports that uh, the, an Ivor Lewis is the preferred option and occasionally a McEwen's could also be concerned for C1C1. Uh, if the involvement of the esophagus is less than 3 centimeters, there is this trial which is published in British Journal of Surgery, a Japanese randomized trial, Sasako and Sano, which shows that a trans hiatal proximal gastrectomy or gastrectomy is adequate. So that is if the esophageal involvement is less than 3 centimeters, but the evidence is limited. And this particular thing about the extent of resection for GE junction tumors probably will be answered in this cardia trial. It's a Dutch multicentric trial which deals only with these uh, G, uh, C words type 2 lesions and probably this trial will give us an uh, uh, answer to what is the perfect approach or the best approach for G junction tumors and what is the extent of lymphadenectomy required as well. Now that we decided uh, you uh, the best evidence suggests that, that you need to do a minimally invasive approach, how do you go about it? Is minimally invasive a good idea is the next question again, another talk in itself. Uh, fortunately, this is one area which uh, there is strong randomized evidence which supports the, our logical thought process. So anyone would say that minimally uh, invasive obviously should have better short-term outcomes. Fortunately for us, the time trial with a small one, single center, uh, as in a small group of centers, which compared open was purely rats is uh, that is a thoracic part, the abdomen could be open. They showed that there, there was favorable short-term outcomes, including uh, a drop in uh, pulmonary complications by almost 50%. That's a 50% reduction in pulmonary complications if you did it thoracoscopically. So, but uh, what if you did it open and the abdomen laparoscopically? This is another trial which is off quoted, a recent one. It's called the Miro trial. It showed that even if you open the chest but did the abdomen laparoscopically, there was a significant drop in complications, uh, roughly around 77%. And a non significant survival benefit as well because the patients could take actual therapy. That is a hypothesis. So any form of minimally invasive uh, thoracoscopic or laparoscopic approach help in improving uh, the patient's recovery. What about robotic? This is the buzzword. Uh, so there are two small trials. One is a robot trial and one is a RAMI trial. They compared themselves against bats as well as open. Uh, not surprisingly, their robotic results were similar to what was achieved in bats but definitely superior to what seen open. So my answer to this is MIS is definitely superior to an open approach uh, in, uh, in Isvegetim. Uh, to be noted as you need adequate uh, experience and skill to do this. So the important thing is stick to oncological principles and that's what gives the advantage and if it is technically not feasible, please convert to open. It, uh, uh, a detrimental minimally invasive procedure should definitely not be performed. Now that you've finished the section uh, thoracoscopically or open and transthoracic or uh, otherwise, the route uh, we have to think about reconstruction, and these are the various uh, issues in reconstruction. The first one is a conduit. So obviously there are three ways to do it. Stomach, as you must have all seen, occasionally the colon when you have significant involvement of both the structures, uh, and sometimes a medical uh, jejunum which. So the stomach is the simplest uh, uh, way to uh, perform. And the stomach is a preferred route in most cases. There are some studies which have shown that the colon can be used and uh, it gives better quality of life because you can use a stomach as a reservoir. Uh, it involves three, uh, it's technically challenging, much more challenging than normal Isabegas, and three anastomoses are required. So it is not advocated for normal practice. A medical jejunum cannot be uh, used for cervical anastomosis because the reach does not go about the arch of the aorta. This is something which I have experienced myself. So definitely do that. Okay? Only for an Ivor Lewis at max, not for a McLeans. Uh, now that you've decided you're going to, uh, the stomach is the simplest, uh, the next question is, do you use the whole stomach or tube the stomach? The answer is that gastric tube is preferred to the entire stomach. Because if you use the stomach, the uh, uh, incidence of the flux uh, and distension of the stomach is much higher. So gastric tube is preferred. So how why should you make it? Definitely no great evidence supporting either. There are a number of studies which are looked at it retrospectively. Uh, there is no effect on tissue blood flow. There are techniques which are used including ICG to see which one is better. But 
is no particular study has shown that a difference between 3.5 to 5 or more than 5 is there a difference none so it's important to tube the stomach but the exact width the stomach we really don't know once you decide to make the stomach tube do you do a pyloric drainage there is so much debate about it there are actually three meta analysis which have looked at it unfortunately there is no clear winner whether to do or not to perform so some patients after hysterectomy uh, develop gastric outlet obstruction uh, to the tune of uh, 40% in some series and because of the obstruction and distension and sometimes micro aspiration probably doing a pyloric drainage has an advantage and there has been a non significant advantage uh, benefit seen with obstruct uh, pyloric drainage in some of the meta analysis definitely no major impact but a non significant benefit so in our series uh, in our patients we definitely do a pyloro myotomy or internal dilation that's a dilation that's what we do but uh, no strong evidence to support it again once you made the stomach you what is the root uh, root of the quadri you could place it in the posterior medial sternum but is a logical place sometimes uh, when you want to uh, address the medial sternum with post operative radiotherapy and the stomach is very sensitive to radiotherapy you cannot place it there in which case you have to use a retrosternal root sometimes we have even placed it subcutaneous because we could access the retrosternal root as well so, so logically the posterior medial sternum seems adequate with a shorter distance lower b plate etc etc is there any data to support one group over the other uh, people are uh, you know check this out this is from the japanese national clinical database more than 3000 and 6000 patients compared you will be surprised at the uh, more rate of stomach stomach tubes in japan this is often a standard practice there uh, which i myself was surprised to see when i travel uh, In this particular series, they found that the posterior mediastinal root was associated with a lower anastomotic leak, uh, probably because of shorter root and less tension. That's what I feel, but higher pulmonary complications. There are some studies which have shown that there is no difference in length requirement between the two roots as well. Uh, controversial. Uh, this and the meta-analysis uh, of randomized trials for root of the reconstruction again uh, they showed that there was no benefit uh, or a big difference between the two roots of reconstruction. and there was no difference in other outcomes or pulmonary function as well so you could pick either of one of these but in general posterior medial sternum being the shorter root and uh, less uh, chance of leaks this is what we prefer we use the retrosternal root only when uh, we are going to deliver postoperative radiation therapy to the posterior medial sternum once that you uh, now that you pull the, the stomach tube into uh, the neck what is the anastomotic technique which you use we earlier started off with an so anastomosis in each tube four layer then two layer uh, then we have switched over to an uh, stapled anastomosis and uh, we use a modified collar technique or that's what we use now uh, with linear staples the triangulating anastomotic technique uh, this is a meta analysis of more than 2000 patients and these are two important uh, criteria which we look at in an anastomosis that is a leak rate which is mentioned over here and the rate of stricture in anastomosis which is a problem with hand sewn anastomosis and in both these criteria the staple technique comes out the winner decreases hand structures are much less with the triangulating staple anastomosis so we have more in the direction of staple technique and that is the way the world is moving expensive but that's the way to go so that completes the surgical uh, aspects which uh, i intended to discuss so now we go about to what you need to do uh, in addition to uh, surgery so i kept it very short and this because uh, even uh, uh, this part is uh, entire half an hour lecture itself all you need to know is neogen treatment is the preferred modality not adjuvant neogen treatment has shown to improve survival and that's what's preferred in most cancers now which one do you pick chemotherapy or chemo radiation for squamous cancers the answer is neogen chemo radiation gives you the best uh, Logical complete response rates to the tune of 50 percent. These are the two trials which have been uh, have got impressive, you know, uh, 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 paradigm shifting results. So the cross trial and the neocritic trials are the trials which have to quote in an exam. They have changed our practice completely. Uh, the neocritic trial, the Chinese one, actually improves uh, survival to almost 100 months. It's the mortality. So uh, that's the standard. There has also been a meta analysis which has compared NACTRT versus. Uh, neogen chemotherapy and there have been three meta actually and all have shown in the subset that in squamous cell carcinomas neogen chemo radiation 
uh, is favor has favor of block blocks. So in squamous cell carcinoma, you have truncate variation. What about in adenocarcinomas? If you look at all these trials, we find that in the subset of adenocarcinomas, they didn't do that well. They did better, but not that well with neodymium chemo radiation. So currently, the standard would be very of chemotherapy. That's my feeling because it I'm talking across trials. We got impressive trial uh, data from the MAGIC trial, which you all know, and the recently concluded, uh, recent, not so recent, flawed trial. Both show that uh, very operative therapy is a well close to. Uh, 50% uh, as per the flock trial. Uh, now, the elephant in the room is that we don't know whether it's actually uh, better than neogen chemo radiation because they're not being compared uh, directly. But that's it to come. It's mentioned in a few trials. I'm going to talk about it. Now, adjuvant treatment. There, there's no role for adjuvant chemotherapy other than the perioperative uh, as part of the perioperative regimen. If you give adjuvant radiotherapy, it's only for certain margins. There is no other evidence for uh, giving adjuvant periotherapy. Now, in some cases, if you are not been able to give, deliver perioperative chemotherapy for adenocarcinoma, you could use a McDonald's protocol, which is the high interpret 0113 trial, and give adjuvant chemoradiation as well. But uh, it is very difficult to deliver and the results are not great as well. Now, there are unresolved issues, like I said. Uh, there are, uh, because we have got a clear picture in what to do in neojoint uh, Sclerosis of plasma, neogen chemo radiation as well. There is one trial called the NeoRest trial, uh, which is compared with NACT, which again gives a confounding picture uh, whether neogen chemotherapy is adequate. Uh, we don't know. These are the trials, the NeoAGES, the ESOPEC, and the next trial. These are the trials which are comparing neogen chemotherapy or perioperative chemotherapy with neogen chemo radiation. And the results of these trials will give us a clear answer. These are the trials which you should be reading up in the next few uh, months or the years when they come out. Will give us a clear answer uh, uh, to this debate, whether which is the correct modality or the better modality for neogen treatment. So in conclusion, uh, uh, I hope I have covered every relevant topic. Uh, uh, thorough staging and a functional evaluation is mandatory. And the thorough staging means a PET CECT. So it's not a CECT anymore, is it? PET, TG, PET, CECT, the thorax is mandatory. You need a complete functional evaluation in, in addition to uh, assessing the general condition of the patient, which includes pulmonary function and cardiac evaluation. It's important to implement a rehabilitation and ERAS uh, program in your practice. This will improve the recovery of these uh, patients. Uh, but, but please remember the evidence supporting this the guidelines are common 2019. Take the appropriate neurogen treatment, a very small fraction of your patients which have been picked up at US, uh, as T1 and T2 are the only ones you can operate with upfront surgery. The, all the rest require neurogen treatment. You know, depending on the pathology, the extent of the disease, what to pick, a neurogen chemo radiation or chemotherapy. Uh, the best evidence supports a trans thoracic resection. You can decide depending on the lesion whether it's neurogen uh, is uh, McEwan's or an Ivor Lewis. And if possible, technically feasible in your setup with experience, uh, MIS is preferred. Uh, that's very strong evidence. Robotic not so, but still present, but MIS is preferred. Now, when uh, it comes to uh, lymphadenectomy, two field lymphadenectomy is a minimum standard, uh, which uh, is a standard and the minimum to be done for both esophageal lesions as well as G junction tubers, time one and two. And uh, when it comes to reconstruction, stomach is a preferred one doing with tubing. The, uh, the width is open to debate. Little stone, uh, sorry, I, this is a typo. Uh, posterior medicinal route is preferred, and the restriction route only used when you give uh, radiotherapy. Pyloric uh, drainage may be performed. There is no great evidence supporting it. But if you uh, do a form of pyloric drainage, uh, you might find uh, that some of the softer endpoints like pulmonary complications and gastric outlet obstructions might be less. Staple uh, anastomosis is recommended. There's enough evidence to support it. Implement an ERAS protocol the moment the surgery is over as well. It's important to give the patient physiotherapy and nutrition, uh, internal nutrition at the earliest. There's a component of the ERAS protocol. And uh, as part of the adjuvant, which I mentioned earlier, adjuvant radiotherapy, in case of postal margins only. So that brings me to the end of the talk. I hope I've stuck the time, actually. Oops, I've done. Uh,
35 minutes, so we do have uh, some time for questions. Yeah, yeah. no, yeah, no, you, you, you have still a lot of time, no problem. Oh, okay. So one hour we give, no problem. Anyhow, uh, now we can open the question. There are a lot of questions in chat box as well as Q&A section. Can you check that? Yeah, yeah, yeah I just open it. Uh, okay, patients were, uh, the first question is from uh, Zalak. Patient with wet thoracic esophageal SCC with right supraclear with no positive. How should we approach? So the question about uh, stand, uh, extent of lymphadenectomy uh, as a standard approach is for N0 or infracarine lymph nodes where there is no role for doing a 3 feet. In such a patient, with uh, when you have a mid-third with a right superclavic node, which is mobile, not a bulky, unresectable one, the option is to do a 3 feet lymphadenectomy. The results are not great. What we do is we give neojuvin chemotherapy because the entire field can, cannot be covered with uh, chemo radiation. We give neojuvin chemotherapy and resect. Our three-year survival was 21%, which is not bad. This is a very poor prognosis disease, but the three-field lymphadenectomy, we were able to achieve around 21% three-year survival. So that would be the way to go. Uh, so the second question is the technique of pyloric drainage. This is from Mahesh Jitani. I would say I would do a pyloromyotomy. That's been our practice. We slowly migrated from a uh, uh, we, uh, 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 myotomy, which is what we do, uh, we used to do. And occasionally we opened the pylorus and we created more complications. So we have sw uh, switched to a mechanical dilatation and we do it uh, intra op through, an open, uh, through a gastrotomy, which is then excised as part of the stomach uh, tubing process. So internal dilatation is what we currently do. It's very, very safe. Although uh, we had two episodes we, where we managed to do the duodenum while dilatation itself. So uh, it should be done carefully, uh, not free of completely free of complications. Uh, so, so this is uh, Manish Jitani, I think. He's asked another question about the use of uh, ICG. There are many uh, techniques which uh, have been used to look at uh, the uh, blood supply in the fundus, including the use of uh, ICG. Uh, of benefit but no great event. There have been, you know, uh, uh, supercharging. There are things which are used like supercharging of the stomach tube. When you pull the stomach tube up, we uh, anastomose the terminal short gastric, so superior thyroid artery, which boosts the blood supply to the fundus. Uh, you could preoperatively ligate uh, the left gastric artery to uh, improve the blood supply to the fundus. There are many techniques used, but nothing is foolproof. Uh, the leak rema rate remains 10% in the best of centers. So every technique, technique uh, and the care you provide helps, but uh, nothing is foolproof. A leak is some, a reality of life and you will find it in quite a number of patients. Uh, again, another question regarding the endos uh, sponge. This is a complication, it's a massive topic which I did not address. Endo sponge is extremely uh, useful. It is very expensive. What we've done is we have fashioned an endosponge ourselves from uh, what we used is mm, the sponge which we use for vac dressings in plastic surgery. We cut it and fashion it depending on the size of the leak attached to the rice tube and insert it to the sponge and uh, apply suction. Uh, technically, uh, it is recommended to change it every 48 hours. So, but, uh, due to logistical reasons, we remove it only after we change it every, every week. Uh, we found improvement in healing rates and leaks, including quite massive ones. Uh, but it needs a very cooperative patient to perform the procedure. Because, uh, plus the rise to now to the news uh, nose is very difficult for the patient to tolerate. And uh, we had complications, including you know uh, severe aspiration as well as nasal ala necrosis in one particular patient. But it is a useful adjunct to the management of uh, anastomotic leaks, and we should definitely try it. Uh, another question is about the use of three field over two field. I must tell you that if a lymph node is involved in a particular area, we resect that regardless of the response. If you so, if you find lymph nodes in the superior mediastinum or in the cervical area, regardless of the response, you should do a three field lymphadenectomy. The quote saying that two field is standard was uh, was meant only if it is N zero in all the in the supracranial area. Uh, the next question is stations of mediastinal lymphadenectomy two field. So the two field is uh, infracarinal, subcarinal, uh, lower parasvigial, middle parasvigial, uh, cardiac, 
and the gastrohepatic lymph nodes. But you do not do the hepatic uh, SMA or the distal splenic. It's only 9, 10 and uh, 9 and 11, 8, 9 and 11. So that's the extent. Uh, there's another question is about the impact of the anlematous disease on PET CT. PET CT is not great at uh, detecting lymph nodal disease. So uh, uh, in our data in esophageal cancer, as, you know, in lung cancer, if a lymph node picks up on the PET CT, you have a 50% chance that it is positive. Uh, you could be false positive in 50%. Uh, so you will have to look at the morphological features on the CT scan as well. You can take a call on resecting this uh, either by preoperatively checking with an FNAC from the supraglandular area or an EUS or you could look, look at the response from uh, the, uh, after an EOGN and then take a call. Uh, it's important to pass such patients through an MDT and the MDT is mandatory. That's something which I forgot to mention in the stock of an MDT with uh, Bioimaging spectrals is mandatory and that helps you, that will help you make a better call. Uh, how should we manage anastomotic stricture in the neck after three months of surgery? Uh, immediately after the surgery, I uh, it's very difficult to manage an anastomotic stricture because any kind of dilatation of the stricture would cause and uh, disrupt the anastomosis. So I would wait for it to mature a little bit more before attempting a balloon dilatation. Uh, that's what I would uh, do. So uh, Jack, are there are questions also in the chat box. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm going to go to that. I was, uh, the, there are so many on this one. You know, I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how popular you are and how important this topic. And students oh, wow. finally got hold of you to answer everything. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's an amazingly interactive audience. Thank you everyone for all the questions. Uh, the methods to identify the thoracic duct. Now, the best way to do it, uh, if you have a thoracic uh, issue, is to use ICG. But uh, I can uh, tell you for sure that IgG and the equipment is not freely available. So the best way to look at it is to look between the uh, uh, between the azygous ascending limb of the azygous and the descending iota on the right side. Take all the tissue between the azygous and the uh, iota at the level of the inferior pulmonary vein. That's the area where you will get the thoracic duct as a single block and that is uh, where you like it. Now, if the question about managing a leak, uh, there is evidence for and against routine ligation. So generally, you should not ligate it as a standard. If you expose the thoracic duct for a significant length due to, uh, if you're doing an extensive lymphadenectomy, as well as if there is an obvious leak, you should ligate it and that's a point where you should ligate it. God forbid, if there is a small leak, you can do a conservative management with a fat-free or a medium triglyceride diet. That's what is recommended. If you're not able to manage with conservative management or the leak is large, more than 1,000 to 1,500 ml per day, it, it is best to go in and ligate it. Now, if you're technically, you find that ligation is difficult or if you're not sure how to, where to find the leak, please do a lymphangiography. Again, it requires interventional radiology support and probably dissection of the inguinal lymph nodes. And sometimes we even uh, dissect the axillary chain. So we approach the lymphangiography from both sides to find out where the leak is. It might be in the root neck as well. And uh, the, uh, our protocol is to do lymphangiography and not embolize for 48 hours. Generally, the lymphangiography itself will cause fibrosis of the lymphatic chain and stop the leak. If it doesn't, then we do a embolization. That's what we do. Now I'm going to go to the chat line, which is another set of questions. Uh, CBS type 2 post neovagin, very good response there. How much proximal margin will we take? Uh, the recommendation is to go for a parbur et al. That's more than 400 patients. The recommendation, and that's what we follow here, uh, is to X vivo margin of at least 3 centimeters. This equates to 5 centimeters margin, and that's what the uh, that gives the best survival and the best negative one. We sent all our CWATs to for frozen section. May not be available in every center. We do it because we are very worried about submucosal disease and we specifically ask the uh, pathologists whether they look at submucosal disease. Uh, but that's what we do. We will go for the post new age went margin, but we will send it for uh, frozen and 3.8 cross margin is what we're looking at. Uh, which approach is better after neurogen chemoradiation, either Lewis or McEwan? Uh, 
it's an excellent uh, question uh, the generally the neogen chemo radiation the margin is 4 to 5 cm above and below so there is a worry about an increased leak rate with uh, an iver lewis this has been taken to account in the i can trial so the leak rate still is less than a maximum because the stomach is more vascularized uh, in practical uh, in practice what we do in our institute is when we have such a debate we always ask for the radiation field from the uh, from the radiologist and we try to make the anastomosis an area which has not been irradiated it's an important practical thing you will be working with your team of radiation oncologists or if it's related to another center please ask for the radiation field from the corresponding specialists and that will help you decide where to keep the anastomosis it's something which is need needs to be discussed in the pre operative clinic uh, the approach so uh, another good question uh, conduit necrosis it is something which is a reality which happens in very few patients probably we encounter one or two in a year we do Close to 200 disinfectectomies. Uh, the patient, the first uh, suspect conduit necrosis because the patient uh, 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 drops dramatically. You will find uh, hemodynamic instability, significant acidosis on the ABG, tachycardia. The patient, uh, you know, condition drops dramatically. Uh, there are two uh, techniques to uh, do it. First thing is stabilize the patient. That's mandatory. The most common site of a necrosis is the distal conduit, that is closer to the neck. Uh, first thing that we do uh, in general, if we suspect a dramatic drop, is what we do is an endoscopy, which can be done in the ICU itself. Uh, you do it yourself. You can pick up discoloration of mucosa and implanting necrosis or a frank necrosis by pure endoscopy. Uh, if that's possible, that's best. If there is doubt, do a CECT thorax. Uh, the clearest sign that there is necrosis is intramural air in the stomach tube. That if you find air in the wall of the stomach tube. It's a clear sign the stomach tube is necrosed. Still, if you have a doubt, already take the patient on the general anesthesia. Open the neck. Just open the neck and see the stomach tube yourself. We have been fooled by situations where the stomach tube has been stained by bile or you know uh, altered blood, and you felt this necrosis uh, on endoscopy, but it is not. It is just coating. So important to flush the stomach wall while doing endoscopy, and if it's still in doubt, open the neck. And the GA and examine the stomach tube, and if required, you can bring it out as a double and re-anastomose later, or even re-anastomose at the same time. Usually, when you open the neck, in this situation, uh, if the patient is unstable, uh, is stable, we do not reconnect. What we do is we keep it out as a double panel in the neck and reconnect later. It's a viable option. Uh, what is the best technique for intrathoracic anastomosis? Uh, my answer to every question regarding anastomosis is do what you are comfortable with. There is no perfect answer to which is best. Uh, stapling, as I said, uh, evidence favors that. Try all forms of anastomosis, including hand sewn, the circular, side to side. Uh, logically, the modified collage style thing, which is used in the neck with a side to side, seems to be the best. But there is no evidence to support one. Uh, so, in terms of Economics and your surgical experience. What you find best in your technique, please do it. Whatever you are comfortable is great. The question about PET CCT only or CCT tracks just separately? Uh, no, uh, I would say that a CCT as a part of the PET CCT is adequate. So what uh, the CT in general is a 16 slice CT. You're not looking at a cardiac 128 slices. 16 slices is good enough, and most of you will have a 32 slice CT scan. It's a uh, good comp for a PET CT. Only thing, important thing is, do not forget to give contrast. That's an important thing. Uh, uh, excellent question from Onblock Isvigectomy. Uh, there is no randomized evidence to support Onblock Isvigectomy. I've tried Onblock uh, a few times, uh, not as a routine. For lesions which are T3 clearly involving the area of the thoracic duct or the close to the adventitial iota or the zygos, we do an Onblock Isvigectomy. The lymph node yield is, uh, goes up by almost 3. Uh, there is no great evidence to support uh, uh, one or other techniques. You could do it if technically possible. But I wouldn't take the thoracic duct as a routine if, unless it's uh, frankly involved. So, depending on the case, no great evidence. Uh, there is another question. Uh, the circular statement. 
The surplus paper to use in a neck anastomosis, you need a really long stomach, so it is not something which we, uh, not always possible, uh, not uh, regularly used. So for a, a left or abdominal proximal gastrectomy or an Ivor Lewis, 25 cent, uh, a size is what we generally use. Now, if you find an esophagus which is very dilated due to a dilated uh, obstructed lesion, you can use a 29 centimeter. You might find a 25 inadequate. In such cases, with a dilated esophagus, using a 29 is a best strategy. Now, even in such cases, if you have used, done a total gastrectomy and are using a jejunum, I would advise you to limit the size of 25. Uh, 29 is a very difficult fit in a jejunum and virtually impossible. So, as a rule, 25 in a dilated esophagus, 29. That's the answer. Uh, role of SLNB in esophagus, limited evidence to support it. Uh, there are four, it, the vascularity is almost linear, but you find skip lymph nodal involvement. So I don't think this is going to come up as standard practice any soon. Uh, it's one of the reasons I didn't put any evidence or any comments supporting it. Uh, if G junctional tumor with uh, this is from Yogesh, uh, G junction tumor with four centimeter proximal involvement and stomach going to be not possible due to tumor extension, the plan would be to do an Ivor Lewis sort of surgery with. Uh, with uh, a general conduit, do a total gastrectomy, resect the stomach, uh, resect the esophagus with a clear margin. You could use a left thoraco abdominal approach, which is what we do in uh, Tata Memorial. And uh, the jejunum will go up to the iota. So we have done a subbiotic anastomosis to the remnant esophagus with the jejunum. And left thoraco abdominal approach gives you excellent exposure, gives you an adequate uh, margin, similarly as well as distally. Unfortunately, it cannot be done minimally invasive. It involves cutting the diaphragm, cutting through the ab chest wall and the abdomen. Uh, we recently uh, presented our series in uh, ESTS, 150 odd patients. Uh, we had we did the frozen section in all zero positive margin, so we could get a clear margin on all patients um, uh, in our series. So that's one advantage of a left of problem. And this kind of lesion, probably that's the best approach to take. Uh, can you elaborate on stapler anastomosis? Wow, uh, that is a difficult question. So, for lower uh, thoracic or G junction tumors, a circular uh, stapler is going to be used, or you could use a linear firing te technique using endoscopic uh, staplers. Uh, for the neck anastomosis, favor using a linear stapler using a triangulating anastomosis or modified Pollard technique. Best uh, leak rates, uh, lowest leak rates, and lowest structuring rate. Uh, any study regarding uh, this is from Purna Shetty, the Anglomatous Nodes in Thoracic Cancer. Uh, we published our series uh, from the histopathological uh, final HPRs of uh, our patients, uh, both in esophageal cancer as well as lung cancer. Uh, the lung cancer rate was around 19%. And uh, esophageal cancer was around 16% granulomatous lymph nodes. Uh, now, these are granulomatous lymph nodes. There are non-specific in infections. We are not committing on tuberculosis and all these. But these could be because of other etiologies causing uh, granulomatous lymph nodes as well. An important thing to note, which our pulmonologist also, uh, also comments on, is we did not give anti-tuberculous treatment because we didn't know etiology of granulomatous disease in all these patients. But this is a finding in most histopathology reports. And we left the patients alone and they're doing quite well. Uh, what to do for recurrence and left in uh, two years after completion of... So, this is very simple. If you find uh, recurrent disease in uh, another area and it is non-metastatic disease, local regional recurrence only, if you perform surgery up front, then do chemo radiation. Perform chemo radiation at the recur site of recurrence. Now, if you've given concurrent chemo radiation to a patient, then the only option is to resect if you're looking for cure. So, you find a superclad only lymph node uh, recurrence after complaint. I would, do, I would say do a PET CT, exclude metastatic disease, and if that is the only site of disease, do a lymph, lymph node dissection. And depending on the lymph node involvement, you can always boost with radiotherapy at the end. So, the, your treatment in a recurrence is decided by whether it's local regional or metastatic. If metastatic, do not do any go into any aggressive strategy. If it's local regional recurrence only, depending if you are done surgery first, then do chemoradiation therapy. 
if you have done uh, surgery, uh, if chemo radiation at the beginning, do surgery. It works well. Uh, we have quite a number of patients who we have done salvage resections. I don't remember the exact data, but they have done quite well. Uh, anastomotic suture, I have, uh, well. Uh, CMOS3 is squamous cell carcinoma. That's a good question. Uh, it's a diagnostic wandering. Often you find that you patients which look at so proximal stomach disease or clear CMOS3 and the diagnosis comes uh, squamous cell carcinoma <laughs> on the initial biopsy. This is because the disease is poorly differentiated and the pathologist on a small punch of tissue is unable to differentiate between the adeno and squamous. So it is a diagnostic quandary. The question comes, how which neoadjuvant strategy can you follow? You give a flawed thinking as adeno, but the pathologist is squamous. Now the problem comes that you can't give neoadjuvant chemo radiation uh, because the stomach tube is involved. And thirdly, do you a staging do a staging laparoscopy because a squamous cell doesn't require a staging lab technique. I would say pass it through a multidisciplinary team, definitely. Follow the morphology. If it looks like a Sievert 3 disease, it is a Sievert 3 and is most like an adenocarcinoma. Do a staging laparoscopy, please, because there are a couple of patients in whom I said, okay, squamous, no staging laparoscopy, and at the final surgery, uh, uh, neurogenity, I found metastatic disease. So for all disease which looks like a Sievert 3 with proximal stomach involvement, please do a staging laparoscopy. And if in doubt with a poorly differentiated carcinoma, please favor giving perioperative chemotherapy. It may not be as good as NACDRT in some cases, but with a stomach, it's a sensitive organ. Giving neurogenic therapy is not bad. It's not a bad option at all. Uh, now, that's another clever question. A patient, it's a, uh, in our series of patients who have received neutral chemoradiation as well, we found a significant number of defaulters. Uh, we have unpublished data, probably, yeah, probably more than 50 patients in our initial 50. Uh, 43 did not, uh, nine, uh, I think seven, sure, uh, did not follow up. So it's something which you're going to uh, find in your practice that NACTRT relieves symptoms and the patients do not follow up for surgery. Uh, Probably they'll come back for surgery in six or seven months when they recover. So PCR is achieved only in 50% and they may do well. The rest will come to you. Uh, so if the patient is extremely reluctant for surgery and willing uh, for follow-up, uh, based on the pre-SANO trial and the SANO trial, you could do uh, CT every three months, US and endoscopy and guided biopsies, well biopsies, in uh, four-quarter biopsies. And if they are negative, you could follow them up. This is a strategy in followed. Uh, you could follow in potentially uh, in patients who are extremely reluctant for surgery or extremely high risk for surgery. Uh, but no great evidence as of now. We'll have to await the results of the SANO trial before we can follow it. But this brings me back to the question of MDT. If the patient is reluctant for surgery, you should always follow. Go in for full dose chemo radiation, 50 gray and more. Unfortunately, the patients made a delayed call. Uh, then this is the only strategy which you can follow. No great evidence as of now. We'll have to wait for it to come. But, uh, that's the best thing you can do. Uh, in cross protocol use of Sievert 3 uh, uh, exposed to radiation, uh, it's a it's a difficult question to answer. Uh, in stomachs which are being irradiated to 40 gray, in our experience, we find that the stomach is pale and edematous. Uh, you know, our heart is in a mouth when you're doing the anastomosis. Uh, the leak rates are not significantly higher, but it's a scary thing to do. I would advise uh, generally make a good decision pre treatment and not uh, radiate these uh, patients. Giving neodymium chemotherapy it would be perfectly ad uh, adequate. Now, going back to the chat channel, what approximate PCR rate for cross protocol in TMH? Uh, it's not approach 50% for sure. I, we are analyzing a Dr. Naveen Mumbadi from the radiation oncology department is looking at it. It's definitely much higher uh, than uh, what you've seen with neogen chemotherapy. With neogen chemotherapy, two drugs, cisplatin, our rate was 9%. With uh, DCF, that is the additional docetaxel, our PCR rate is 26%. Uh, it is a very toxic regimen. Uh, now, with PCR uh, rate in NACTRT, somewhere between 30 to 40% is what uh, we, uh, I would say. But uh, Dr. Mumbadi would be the perfect person. Uh, surprisingly, with cross protocol, also we adopted only for the last three years. We have a small but not insignificant number of patients who have progressed cross protocol as well. 
as well as the number of patients who have failed to follow up. So the number of patients who have not reached surgery after cross protocol would be around 20%. That's a significant number. So you have to pick the right patient for neurogen chemo radiation. Uh, adjuvant for residual disease in both uh, cross and surgery, uh, based on the keynote trial 816, uh, sorry, checkmate trial, uh, the answer would be nivolumab. That is theoretical. They picked patients, gave neoadjuvant uh, chemo radiation, did surgery. Uh, the patients who did not do well uh, with chemo radiation, that is a PCR, non PCR ones, they gave nivolumab. And uh, there was a significant improvement in survival. So that's the worst prognosis disease after neutral chemo radiation. They didn't build with uh, uh, nivolumab. That is the theory. In practice, we are not given it uh, because uh, it is way too expensive uh, for our patients. So I think that concludes most of the questions. If there yeah, are any God, more, fantastic, topic. fantastic. You know, it's like a marathon. Uh, I'm sure if you give two more hours, students will be attacking you. But uh, beautiful, thanks very much, uh, you know, very, very nice. Thanks, uh, uh, what a uh, best platform. The beauty of this is, uh, you know, even the student who is a beginner gets to meet the leader like you and ask the company. Thank you for the fantastic yeah. answer. Uh, me and DNP board, NB board students are grateful for you. Thank you very much. All the best wishes. And over to the coordinator. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So. Thank you very much. And thanks to all the students also. Any questions? Thank you, sir, for the session. We can conclude the session now. Right. So, thank you very much, everyone. It was a pleasure.